So good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, depending on where you're joining from. This is the um, IGF 2023 Open Forum, um, appropriately titled, Whose Internet Towards a Feminist Digital Future uh, for Africa? My name is Toela Niran Dajere. I work with the African Union Development Agency in Johannesburg, South Africa, and I lead the Economic Integration Division team. And it is my uh, singular honor and pleasure really to, um, to uh, host this session to moderate um, and to actually co-moderate with my colleague, Alice, who is sitting in the room. Um, and really happy to, to have um, both the panelists that are physically present in Kyoto, but also those that are joining um, online um, for this particular session. Um, so just to give a bit, a bit of uh, context in terms of uh, the discussion that we will have today, uh, I think there's been a number of exciting developments from the African Union side in terms of the digital transformation strategy, which the commission has been uh, working on in terms of unpacking that into a number of different policy frameworks and strategies um, for implementation, um, including um, very deliberate strategies related to uh, data policies and data governance, uh, looking at issues of digital ID, looking at issues of um, the tra you know, just transformative aspects of um, digitalization as it applies to different sectors across the continent, whether it's in agriculture, health or education, and really trying to see how to um, appropriately position um, ICTs and digitalization um, at the center of Africa's economic um, transformation. Um, I think attendant with that, of course, will always be the discussions around um, gender inclusiveness and how we really ensure that um, all these different framework strategies um, adequately take um, cognizance of the important aspect of gender um, and particularly the um, issues around inclusiveness when it comes to uh, making sure that these policies and frameworks respond to the needs of women that they actually are inclusive in terms of um, adequately positioning women, not only in the definition of the strategies, but also in their implementation and in the benefits thereof. So this discussion really is meant to give us an opportunity to delve into some of those issues. I've got a very stellar uh, panel um, in front of me um, that will be really looking at, at this issue and trying to unpack for us um, from their experiences, what have they experienced in terms of um, uh, gender inclusiveness? Uh, what have they done in terms of um, the work that they do in terms of promoting gender inclusiveness, uh, but also really the challenges that they have faced? We'll look at some of the barriers um, that perhaps um, we need to address as we look at um, the gender transformative nature of digitalization. And then we will also look at um, some of the opportunities. Ultimately, at the end of the day, we want to be able to have recommendations um, for ourselves as women, uh, recommendations for our policymakers, recommendations for our partners, um, and really recommendations that will ensure that uh, for African women, indeed, the future is digital and it's a digital future that takes cognizance of their role, um, both on the supply side and on the demand side, and in terms of also on the benefits as well. So maybe just to, to, to introduce my panel very briefly, and I'm sure as they also uh, make their interventions, they will also perhaps um, supplement my very brief introduction with some additional information about the work that they have done. So in no particular order, we have Alice Munoa, who is the Senior Director for Africa, uh, working on a project called Mradi at Mozilla. Um, and she has decades of experience uh, working with multiple stakeholders on the continent on different issues, including being the founder and convener um, of Kikkenet. And I'm sure she will tell us a little bit more about that in terms of her experiences with um, establishing that particular organization. We have Bonita Nyamwire, who is joining us online, uh, co-director for research at Policy Uganda, which is a think tank uh, that works at the intersection of data, technology, and design to improve government service delivery. We have Dr. Nena Ifeani Ajufo, a board member of the Network of African Women in Cybersecurity and a professor of technology um, law. We have Ghana Ayman, a Pan-African Youth Ambassador for the Internet Governance Forum and a student studying at Cairo University. We have Liz Orembo, who is a research fellow at Research ICT Africa based in Kenya. Um, and she basically um, has worked also in other capacities carrying out national 
cybersecurity assessments. And last but not least, we are joined by the only male uh, on the panel, so who will give us the male perspective, but also perhaps the, the partner perspective um, on this. Uh, Tobias Thiel is the director of um, the GIZAU office in Addis Ababa, and we are really pleased that he is able to join us for this session. So with that, let's get into it. We will, um, of course, have a few rounds of questions and then specifically to the different partner, to the different panelists. Uh, but we're also very much welcoming um, our online um, participants um, to also, I think, uh, make use of the chat functions in terms of your Q and A's. Um, and then also in terms of the, uh, the people that are in the room, um, also please hold your questions so we can um, take them when we do the uh, Q and A um, session. Um, just to also um, acknowledge the fact that Alice has generously um, agreed to support and co-moderate this session with me, um, and she will be helping us um, with the Q&A part of the um, session. So, Alice, I'm going to start with you um, and, and really um, just looking at um, the, the, the different experiences um, that are in the room and, and among the panelists. Um, and how we have all traversed um, this digital journey. Um, I think you've been working um, in digital policy making for a long time. You helped establish the Kenya ICT Action Network, KICTANET. Um, you have done a lot of consulting, um, including for the African Union, and you are now working uh, for Mozilla um, as a director. Um, so maybe just share with us um, what has been your experience um, in terms of paving the way, I think, for, for so many um, young African women um, who have, you know, are on this journey um, and hoping to follow um, in your footsteps. Um, Alice. Okay, thank you very much, Toella, and thank you very much, uh, uh, GIZ, for inviting me uh, to be uh, on this uh, panel and uh, to co-moderate uh, uh, with you, Toella. Uh, I've known Toella for very many years, and uh, you've really made me, you've aged me, you've really made me, yes, yes, I'm actually quite old uh, in this space. Uh, <laughs> having started when we used to call this uh, communication for development, or even before communication for development, we used to call it social communications. Um, so yes, um, you know, and yes, my first job was actually beginning to look at what the internet, the, the impact that the new so-called internet was having uh, on society when I was then working for the Vatican, uh, the Vatican Radio, and we were, we were uh, creating uh, the Vatican II Council. Okay, God, yes, I'm old. Um, and uh, we were the first ones to actually begin to interrogate what uh, this so-called new technology uh, was about and, and what impact it would have uh, in society generally. So, um, and yes, I was actually the second or third cohort of, of women to be allowed uh, to attend uh, the prestigious uh, Pontificia Universitas Gregoriana, the Vatican, uh, and, and also uh, as a program um, uh, assistant for the Africa service of the Vatican Radio. So my, my um, uh, background in communication um, is quite, is quite you know, very fast. So, uh, my, and my first laptop was actually those huge things that uh, needed a whole wheelbarrow to uh, <laughs> to carry uh, when 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 I lived in Rome. So it's it's quite it's quite a long journey. Um, and by then, then you know, um, we were looking at radio, and then from then the internet, and then I was involved with the uh, World Summit on the in uh, Information Society. Uh, and and they are really uh, acknowledging that there was a huge gender gap in that women were not involved in the discussions, the discourse, and even the building uh, of this new technology, uh, the internet. Uh, so that's how far I come, and I would find myself in in these spaces as the only woman. And uh, and for and for those who know how that can be. I don't want, I mean, I think I am going to use the word violent. It can be really a violent space to be the only uh, woman and the only black woman uh, in these spaces. Um, but then we did it. Um, and also then coming home to Kenya where the Kenyan government had declared the internet illegal, 
uh, and having to fight that, um, that, that whole process. Uh, our government actually uh, did not want the internet introduced in, in, in our country because there was this perception uh, that it was taken away from the Kenya Posts uh, and telecommunication, what you used to call Telecom Kenya. Um, lonely journey in that um, uh, we didn't, nobody understood this technology, the government uh, policymakers did not un uh, understand this technology, did not understand um, how, um, uh, you know, th the, how it could contribute uh, or, or what value it was bringing uh, to, nas to, to its own national development framework or the way they thought about uh, the development framework. So it's through that and through um, joining together with, um, I, I actually started working, my first job uh, was with the Association for Progressive Communications with, uh, with Andriet here running um, as their program officer for communications, running a huge project called Catalyzing Access to ICTs in Africa that was funded uh, by the UK government, the DFID. And it's from there that I then created uh, the Kenya ICT Action Network simply because the reason why I created the Kenya ICT Action Network was because uh, a lot of people, on one end you had government that did not understand uh, the internet. Then you have the pri private sector that understood uh, the potential of the internet. And you, there was the in, uh, so civil society that also understood the potential for the internet in, in, in demo democratizing uh, communication. And we were all fighting each other, uh, you know, pooling each other. And so I took on the responsibility to try and, and, and bring, uh, bring us together. And those who are Kenyans know that around this period, till today, um, and it's not just Kenya, actually, it's globally, uh, when you're fighting for any right, there's, it's, it's very easy to be branded, um, you know, terrible names. Um, there's an African saying uh, that when a hyena wants to eat its carbs, it first accuses them of smelling of goats. And so we were accused of being activists. And because once you're called an activist in Kenya, I don't know about other countries, it means that uh, policymakers are not going to listen to you. Neither is the private sector. Actually, neither is the media, unless they're really courageous uh, to, to put down and, and to expose what we are trying uh, to advocate for. Uh, so, um, luckily for us, there was a huge policy window. Uh, a new government came in, the, the, the Kibaki government in 2000, um, and there was a, a, a policy window. And at, at that point, uh, the Ministry of Information and Communication was created, uh, and two of my really good friends, uh, Honorable uh, Tuju and Honorable Rege, were then appointed Tuju as the minister and Honorable Rege as the permanent secretary. And, uh, but then they made the mistake of disbanding uh, <laughs> the Communications Commission, the regulatory body, uh, the board. And by then I had left uh, the APC uh, and was fully committed to just uh, convening and ensuring that um, um, Kicktonet was running. Uh, and fighting to have an ICT policy framework uh, that would allow, especially the private sector and uh, civil society to then do work in the country. Um, and guess what? Kibaki then appointed me to be a commissioner on the regulatory authority and I served for six years there. Um, and uh, serving with uh, the, the various ministers, it was first, the first one, second and third, uh, we managed to bring in um, the fiber optic cable, managed to, do, uh, to uh, um, create competition, uh, signed, uh, I, I, I'm the one who uh, was the chair of the technical committee of the Communications Commission of Kenya then, it used to be called the CCK, now it's called the Communication Authority, um, including um, uh, uh, signing the papers for what we, the famous uh, mobile money, M-Pesa. Mobile money is the most uh, famous mobile um, payment platform actually in the world. Uh, and even Kicktonet is actually the, the, the only network of that nature, although currently it's completely different. Um, uh, government no longer uh, actively contributes. <laughs> Uh, it's become a think tank, which is which um, is brilliant because we had not anticipated, and Riet will actually uh, affirm to this, 
uh, we, we, we continued to do a lot of monitoring and evaluation, and we were very clear that we didn't expect Kiktonet to survive beyond uh, the creation of the ICT policy, that it has survived uh, beyond that is a huge legacy, and I'm very, very proud uh, of what it is. Uh, but it was actually quite difficult uh, doing that as a woman. Um, it was lonely. Uh, I was the only woman, uh, but I was very, very fortunate to be supported by really strong, um, a very strong team of men and allies. Um, so the, the, the former minister um, of information communication, uh, the immediate former minister, Joseph, uh, jo Joseph Moshero, uh, created the, uh, the network with me, uh, and it, was, it, it is what it is now. Um, and as a woman, and I knew how difficult it is, especially for young women, to get into this kind of leadership position. So I only stayed long enough to be able to pave the way and hand it over uh, to uh, the current convener, Grace Kithaiga. And I remember uh, making her promise me that she will not uh, continue becoming a convener for more than five years so she can hand over to the next women uh, so we can have even more women in this space. Uh, so I moved from there and uh, worked with the African Union for about three years. Uh, that was, um, I think, the most difficult period of my life because I became the punching bag. Uh, I, I was an easy target. I became the punching bag for our uh, top-level uh, domain, Dot Africa. Um, we were fighting um, for our top-level domain, Dot Africa, from an American. Um, that wanted it, uh, so an American wanting <laughs> a domain name that belongs to an entire continent. Um, how I became a punching back was because I was the only woman among a team of men that was fighting for that. We eventually had the, uh, the domain name delegated uh, to uh, the African Union and uh, with the backhand manager, the Z ZACR. Uh, and I'm really proud, proud of that. Uh, moved from then, and I am now leading um, and worked for uh, Mozilla for about two years as the policy lead for Africa, and I'm now leading uh, a program that's looking at uh, having Mozilla, uh, Mozilla's presence in the glo global majority, so in Africa, South America, uh, and Asia. Uh, because Mozilla is an, Af uh, an American company uh, that hasn't actually uh, made such a, you know, a huge effort to be global. So my role is actually to create a blueprint for Mozilla to show up globally and to show up globally differently because Mozilla is not big tech. Mozilla is a mission-based company, although I work for the corporation, not for the foundation. Uh, but we are a very different kind of corporation. We, be we believe in um, an, an, an internet that is truly healthy joyful and puts people, uh, especially women, uh, back in control of their online lives. I'll, I'll leave it at that uh, for, any qu for any questions. Uh, back to you, Toella. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Alice. And, and I think um, maybe you know, the themes of persistence, resilience, and also being able to, to pave the way and hand over and pass the baton to other women, I think, um, are coming through in terms of your story. So I'm going to turn to you, Bonita, um, and, and I know that um, you do quite a lot of research um, in terms of uh, looking at issues um, around um, women's um, participation in the internet. You have co-authored um, a very interesting report uh, about alternate realities and alternate internets and how African feminist research um, can actually guide um, a feminist internet. And I'm curious to know a little bit more about this research um, and really um, what were the most interesting insights that uh, you were able to uncover, um, Bonita. If you can uh, see me and hear me, uh, please let me know. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bonita, as already introduced, I work for policy as a co-director in research. And uh, the research that Toela is talking about, we conducted um, as policy in 2019-2020. That was uh, in, in five African countries, Uganda, Kenya, 
uh, South Africa, Senegal, and Ethiopia. And in this research, we looked at um, experiences of women who use the internet. So general women who use the internet, and we wanted to understand their experiences, gain an insight into their experiences while using uh, online spaces, while using the internet. And we got a very interesting, what we can say interesting findings, but also very sad findings on the side of women and uh, most uh, some of the key findings that we got were uh, that all women are generally uh, affected by online uh, harassment you know in online spaces on different platforms and it is not that only women are affected even men are also affected by by online harassment or online um, gender-based violence, but women are significantly affected. They are more affected compared to men. And we also discovered that it was different categories of women that affected by this online harassment in these digital spaces. There were categories that were more affected than the others. And we looked at... Um, we saw women who are in positions of leadership. Like Alice was saying, she was, you know, a punching bag. Very, very true. I relate uh, with her experience uh, physically, but also online when it comes to women who are in leadership positions, both political leadership and other leadership positions. They are very, very significantly affected by uh, online harassment. Then women human rights defenders, again, goes back to uh, Alice's job at one point as a woman of human rights defender. They are also significantly affected by online harassment because of the work they do. You know, they are trying to, you know, to create uh, safer spaces for other women and girls. So they really become punching bags in online spaces, but also in offline spaces, like Alice really uh, said. Then women in the media women journalists, bloggers, influencers, you know, because of the work they do, you know, they are in the face, you know, of the TV, of online platforms every time, sharing news, raising awareness on different issues. So they also significantly face or experience online harassment. So those were the key uh, categories of women that we found that are significantly affected by online harassment. Then the other key finding uh, from our research was that um, issues of online uh, presence for African women are not as well attended to if you compare to other forms of violence. And this is about online gender-based violence. So you, we found that other forms of harassment or violence or gender-based violence, they are well attended to, they are articulated, they are policies which are very straightforward. But if you look at online harassment, online gender-based violence, it is not uh, as well as um, explored if you compare with, uh, for instance, domestic violence, with int intimate partner violence, with female genital mutilation. I will give an example, for instance, if you come to Uganda to any police station looking for registered or recorded cases of online gender-based violence, you will hardly find any. But you'll find cases of domestic violence have been recorded, cases of intimate partner violence have been recorded, FGM is very recorded in areas where it it was in Uganda or is still even uh, up to today. So you find that these issues of online gender-based uh, violence um, among women, they are not as recorded as if you compare with uh, other cases of, um, of, of forms of violence against women, So, which is a very, very big gap. They actually tend to be uh, pushed away and they are told that, oh, this is a small thing that you can deal with. You can handle that. It's very simple. Or you, you actually, you are the one who caused it, go and handle it, you know? And they may, it is because of the work they do. It is because of their presence on online, um, spaces in digital spaces that they encountered these experiences so that was uh, the other key issue that we found out then the other one 
was that what we see offline actually is reproduced online. You know, the discriminatory agenda practices shaped by social, economic, cultural, and political structures that we see offline, they are really now reproduced online. You know, whatever women are encountering in on offline spaces, they are now are seeing the same thing happening to them in online spaces on social media platforms and so on and, and so forth. The other key finding was that the policies that exist for countering online gender-based violence among women, they are not very explicit about this kind of violence. They are just, they are very silent. They talk about um, cyber security. They talk about uh, discrimination, you know, in online spaces, there shouldn't be discrimination. There should be equality online. Um, the internet is a human right, even for women, but they are not very explicit. They don't really Really come out to say online harassment. They don't really, and against women, you know, because we have other policies, you know, like domestic violence, intimate partner violence, saying all oh, A, B, C, D, X, Y, Z about women, about girls, about children. So that is not yet happening in the context of online gender-based violence. So most of the policies, even the normative frameworks, you know, we they, they talk about, you know, uh, gender equality, but they do not really come out um, about this uh, form of violence. So those are some of the key findings that uh, we 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 um, established from our research, and I will leave it uh, at that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bonita, and, and really thank you, I think, um, for highlighting, I think, the fact that um, perhaps there's a, there's a lot of asymmetry in terms of the information uh, that is being captured about women's experiences online, um, especially when it pertains to, to, to the harm that is caused by online spaces and how that perhaps can then uh, impact on uh, the women's ability to engage effectively with online spaces. Um, I think it's also important maybe as we as we continue having this discussion um, to always be mindful that, um, you know, in our context, I think women span a, a very broad socioeconomic base. So you have women in the rural areas, you have women in the urban, peri-urban, and all of these women are having different experiences of the same issues. And the question is, how does one then um, also begin to address, um, or address that as well? I'm going to turn to you now, uh, Nena, um, and, and I know that um, you are a prolific academic and researcher. You teach on law and technology in the UK, but you're also very connected um, to the policy spaces, um, not only globally, but uh, on the continent as well. Um, and you have a leading role in the AU Cyber um, ex Security Experts um, Group. So I'm curious to, to hear from you, what have your experiences been uh, um, as a woman working in this field, um, but working, um, I think, in two different contexts, you know, one in, you know, in the UK, one in the, in the, you know, here on the continent, and really trying to navigate that space um, in, in terms of the intersection of law and technology, but also um, your journey as a woman um, in that um, space. Nena. Thank you so much, Thawela, and I must say thank you to Alda Nepad for this very important um, conversation, this panel, and of course to GIZ as well. Um, in terms of personal experience, I would say that a huge motivation for me has been women's rights. Um, 17, 18 years ago, which is also interesting to see the dimensions, the differing dimensions of our conversation in terms of women and the discussion. Um, I was researching into criminal um, human rights abuses, international criminal crimes um, in Anglophone Africa then about 18 years ago. And it struck me one day how women's voices could be amplified in terms of being witnesses or being victims. And interestingly, years later, the International Criminal Court is now accepting digital evidence. And for me at that time, it was how do I work in an area where digital evidence, human rights, cyber rights would be relevant. And I think as we have these conversations, there are three key issues that need to be underscored. Um, the first one is 
you know, human rights and technology for women, which Bonita has talked a lot um, about digital rights. There are also questions of cybersecurity and women, um, which Bonita has also highlighted. And also bridging the digital divide is key in Africa, because sometimes when I think about bridging the digital divide in Africa, there are still levels to it. Africa remains the least digitalized region in the world, but not just bridging the gender digital divide as we talk about, but also enhancing inclusion and ownership in the digital space for women. These conversations need to be have uh, to be had in this sort of um, when we promote these discourses. Now, in terms of my experience and you know aligning to promoting women and enhancing women participation and rights for women, I will first of all start by saying that in the policy space, I'll come to the research and academic um, perspective. In the policy space, there is very little focused and targeted policy implementation and even policy development for women in Africa. What we have seen is sort of a charity approach to these conversations. Sometimes I usually say it's easy to come for election campaigns and hear men talk about what they would do for women. And of course, that is also reflected in the digital space. So it's easy for new policymakers to talk about what they want to do for women. But in reality, these policies are not clearly conceptually clear and they are not even there is no plan to implement these policies the other issue is a lack of a harmonized approach to these issues now um, one of the things we pointed out is being in the uk you would see a more harmonized approach to these issues it is clear that this is what the uh, policy is all about this is what the target this is what the outcome this is what the goal is in africa there is no harmonized approach whether from the african union regional level the sub-regional level, and even, even at the national level. So even at the national level, you have this sort of fragmented approach to the issues of women in the digital space, whether it's for inclusion, whether it's for participation, um, digital empowerment, cybersecurity issues, or questions of digital rights. What you then have is a more individualistic approach in terms of capacity building, in terms of access. You have individuals who want to help. You have civil society organizations like Bonita's organizations. But then when you then talk of having it harmonized and measuring the implementation is usually a challenge. The other issue for me is Africa's digital transformation strategy. I mean, we've done well by pushing out a digital transformation strategy for the next 10 years, but I usually ask, um, where is the accountability in terms of the digital transformation strategy? Are we clear on what we want to achieve with the digital transformation strategy? What is the short-term implementation? What is the long-term implementation? It has been there for three to four years now. Where are the gains? We don't see any document anywhere telling us this is what has been achieved who has achieved what and where we are going with the strategy. And I think we have to be practical with these conversations. It is very silent when you talk of women. And so there is even a lack of prioritization of these issues. And I think that is where we also need to start having the conversation. Are we prioritizing issues of gender? And when we talk of gender in Africa, we usually think, oh, it's all about empowering women. You know, it's just about women, but it's a whole triangle of even empowering children, girls, um, the girl child, children and even the family as a whole. And if you look at um, Africa's um, charter on human rights, Africa is one continent that actually stipulates culture and family as a key issue. And I think it's something that should be reflected in other aspects. Now, I also want to talk about research. I think um, in 2017, I was privileged to do a human rights publication on human rights and technology for African women. And sometimes I go back to look for research in relation to women in Africa, there is none. Interestingly, I'm working with Bonita on um, an edited project on cyber rights, and it's been a struggle. Um, getting that book um, published. She knows about this. And it just gets me to reflect on the challenges you have with research. First of all, the challenge of having African researchers in the field. We can't do anything without data. We can't do anything without research. And I think it's one um, thing I've noticed in terms of my experience is a huge challenge in that aspect. We can't have these conversations if we've not mapped the realities. And I know ICT Africa, Lizzie is here. They've been doing 
trying to do so much work as well. So we can't have these conversations if we've not mapped the reality. It becomes more hypothetical than it is real, saying, you know, oh, Africa in terms of culture, gender issues. But then in reality, if we can't map the reality, then we can't actually answer or have um, a valid conversation about these issues. And as we go on, I can talk more about other experiences. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Nena. As I, I will not attempt to summarize all of that, but I will say that what has stood out for me is the fact that number one, we don't want charity. Um, we don't want tokenism. I think women want to be adequately included in all aspects of um, whether it's policy making, policy implementation, research, um, and just making sure that our voices are heard. Um, and I think that um, to the point around um, really the research and, and, and the data and the evidence, um, I think there is also, I think, a space perhaps for having a conversation uh, about how as women we're going to show up um, in, in terms of leading and driving some of these processes, including holding our institutions to account um, when they develop strategies and, and when these strategies now need to be um, implemented. So Tobias, I'm going to now turn to you. Um, I think you have heard from three very powerful women. One more is still to come. Um, but I'm curious to know from you now um, in the role that you have working at GIZ, working with the African Union and really managing that cooperation um, between the GIZ on behalf of you know, the German government and the African Union. Um, based on your experience, um, how do you see um, Germany's development cooperation um, adequately supporting Africa's digital transformation? Um, and what role do you see um, gender inclusiveness uh, playing in the digital sector, Tobias? Okay, I'll try this one, yeah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Toella, and uh, good afternoon to everyone, and uh, good morning to those who are joining us uh, online from the African uh, continent. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here at the, at the IGF, and I would just like to uh, use the, seize the opportunity to thank our hosts, uh, the government and uh, people of Japan for doing an absolutely uh, wonderful job at the hospitality here in uh, Kyoto. Um, since I identify as uh, a feminist and an ally in the cause of uh, women's empowerment, uh, it's of course uh, a particular honor to uh, be on uh, a panel that is basically, uh, except for myself, only uh, uh, staffed with powerful and uh, inspiring uh, women. And I believe that this actually sends also an important uh, signal because I, I think we all know that there is a tendency in international conferences for panels to be rather male-dominated. Um, the theme of this session is, uh, uh, is actually a very uh, important one uh, for the German Development Corporation. I mean, a feminist approach to Africa's uh, digital transformation. It, it both re resonates with the German Development Corporation as a whole in terms of general policy, but also especially with the work that my colleagues and I are doing in the, uh, in the context of our work with the African uh, Union. So as you might know, the German government has uh, made gender equality a key priority, and that includes also uh, having a foreign and develop uh, a foreign and development policy uh, that takes gender equality as a particular priority. So, uh, the German Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, the, the BMZ, recently introduced a new uh, strategic approach, which it calls uh, the feminist uh, development policy. And at the core of that uh, policy or strategy uh, lie uh, the three R's. Uh, there's a focus on rights, resources, and representation as sort of three important dimensions that we need to consider uh, when uh, promoting uh, the cause of women's empowerment. So in that spirit, uh, Germany has set itself the goal of dedicating uh, directly 90% of the resources uh, of the German Development Corporation portfolio globally to contribute to uh, gender equality by 2025. 
And uh, this feminist agenda is, of course, also a close guiding principle for our cooperation with the African Union, including Auda Nepat, uh, where Tuwela works. And uh, together in, in that context, we aim to eliminate discriminatory structures for women and girls and uh, other marginalized groups in the field of digitalization and uh, data governance. And uh, in this context, uh, we try to ensure particularly that female voices are systematically considered in all of the activities uh, of the German Development Cooperation Portfolio, and not only that these voices are included, but also that they actually heard and fight, find the right uh, uh, resonance. And the reason why we do this is out of the conviction, the fundamental conviction that sustainable development cannot be achieved if we don't address the fundamental flaws and inequalities in power structures. And this includes women particularly, who constitute 50% of the population of this uh, planet, but it of course also includes any other group that experiences any form of discrimination based on any of the criteria or char characteristics. So, uh, and in that sense, it's particularly important that gender equality and inclusion become a reality for all. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Tobias. And, and thank you really for, for highlighting those three R's, the rights, the resource, the representation. I don't know about everybody else, but I, I definitely have latched on to that 90%. Um, so we will see um, how we how we um, also uh, make sure that uh, we are able to direct uh, resources adequately towards the uh, participation of inclusiveness of women. But I think it's also perhaps a challenge um, to the continent as well in terms of um, being able to also direct more resources um, to amplifying the voices of women. Um, my last panelist, I believe Liz is now in the room uh, before we go to taking some Q&A and comments from the room and from those online. Liz, I'm just going to invite you um, to really share with us your experience in terms of the work that you've been doing in internet governance, in multi-stakeholder engagement in Africa, um, and, and really perhaps just uh, getting to hear from you, your experience of um, the gaps in terms of where um, you know the, the women's engagement in, in digital processes um, is evident, um, and then also um, what else you have found in terms of your work, um, both at RIA as well as at uh, Kitkanet, uh, Liz. Thank you. Uh, thank you, GIZ, for inviting me to this session, which I'm so passionate about. Uh, and I'd like to start off uh, by saying my story is not a movie like Alice, Alice Munoz <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and the rest, uh, because she actually opened up ways for us, uh, other women who are coming uh, after her. And my uh, actually, my story started out uh, from uh, the global internet governance that she organized in Kenya in uh, 20, was it 2012, 20, 2011. Then I was a student and I was struggling to find out uh, where I would fit in into the society as a second year student uh, taking communications, uh, bachelor education uh, communications. At that time I was I, I was struggling to see whether I would like to be a poet, I would like to be a singer, I would like to be uh, all those things. But then I stumbled upon a notice that uh, said something like, do you want to know how the internet works? And I started volunteering for that organization. But what I didn't know is that I was working on the wrong side of the history. So when Alice, so, uh, when, uh, Alice says that uh, she was being bullied, uh, I was on the team that uh, that that was bullying her. I wasn't bullying, but <laughs> <laughs> but I was on that side until I was invited to the global IGF to market the other side of uh, of uh, Dot Africa, and then I got the story and I was invited to intern at Kenik where she was 
a board member. Also very good experience uh, uh, from that leadership. And uh, from there, I, I got to have a chance to, for, uh, to be in the team that actually formed Internet Society Kenya chapter, which was a struggle uh, uh, to form because of many, a lot of political issues uh, through the 10 years, but it was a success. Um, I'd like to say that at, at that, during that year, uh, tech was really developing in Kenya, but it was so much of an elitist thing and uh, a men's thing. So being in that field as a woman, it was intimidating, and I would agree it's also violent because uh, you raise your hand, no one is, uh, is interested to to get what you're saying. And even when you manage to say something, no one acknowledges it. And it's those those tiny things that actually discourage you from continuing being in the space. At that time, as a woman and as a youth, the spaces to participate in internet governance was very, very little. Uh, and it was a struggle to stay in the space because one, you need to, you, to sustain yourself in the space, you need to travel, you need to contribute uh, as a volunteer. Um, it meant that at that time you're struggling between finding a job that actually pays you and uh, actually uh, um, doing some of these passionate things. And also when you're attending meetings, um, as, as a young woman, you're assigned the role of a note taker and you don't get to contribute to uh, to those meetings. So for a very long time, I was a note taker, but it wasn't a disadvantage. <laughs> it wasn't a disadvantage in the end because you, you, you get to understand, because the field is so dynamic, it meant that you get to understand what people are saying. You have to put it down in a way that other people also um, uh, also understand what was communicated in those meetings. And that really helped uh, grow my, my, my career. So from there, uh, when Gigi was uh, taking over Kicktonet, uh, she invited me to be part of the board members of, of Kicktonet. And uh, I would say the experience there was exciting and challenging at the same time because that was when uh, internet governance and uh, the usage of internet was really opening up in opening up in Kenya and uh, we had to start uh, demystifying concepts of net neutrality privacy in a way that policymakers actually understand and i think that was the most exciting uh, thing for me uh, d during during that time and i remember uh, now moving it forward to now when uh, we are trying to tell people uh, about the concepts of privacy and the data protection, now it's very, very easy. I remember the first times when uh, we were advocating for the same and trying to get parliament to, to put in a data protection policy, parliamentarians would ask, if you're a good citizen, why, wh what do you want to hide? And what would citizen want to hide? And those were very difficult questions uh, uh, also to answer from our end. And so conceptualizing those concepts in a way that policymakers and even people on the ground got to understand and uh, uh, even start working on those policies was, was a challenging thing, but it was also exciting at the same time. Um, so I continued working with with Kicktonet, and I think uh, as Alice mentions that uh, we moved from uh, from that space of engagement. It's still an engagement space, but you also realize that uh, much of the things who are being said on the list, but uh, not being carried out. Uh, uh, or even being followed up. So when government made a commitment to uh, say uh, that uh, they want to follow up with data protection frameworks, uh, then they would need someone to help them, the civil society to help them. And Kiktane became that civil society that actually helped them through, poli uh, through pol policy implementation. That meant that we had to be registered. That meant that uh, we had to uh, start designing uh, the organization from just um, 
where people just engaged but also people collaborated uh, at the back end so after kicktonet i went i moved to global cyber security capacity center which was another exciting venture for me i felt like i had done enough at the national level and we had opened up spaces for participation through the kenya school of internet governance that brought in very many experts from different fields to start uh, working on internet governance issues which kicktonet by itself could not have done that because it was so overwhelming even for for the organization so at the GCACC another exciting work like i've said and i've worked with Toella uh, we were uh, at that time i also started working with Ria because uh, they were very big partners with uh, the GCACC forming the global cyber security capacity center for south africa c3sa and that's where we worked with governments to actually um, build capacity national capacity on cyber security there again it was a uh, another space where women were not actively participate and especially african women and we started driving uh, the concept of uh, cyber security not just being a technical thing but uh, it, it's also it also has a people process and uh, women were so instrumental uh, in participating in cyber security policies one also because they were they are also most vulnerable because um digital literacy they on the other side of digital li uh, the disparity uh, on digital literacy access use um being the nature of the no domestic nature of african uh, homes is that women manage the small bills in homes and they are the, the ones who use the mobile money uh, they are the ones who manage the homes so even being targeted by by cyber um, what do we call them the social engineering tactics was very easy like someone being told that your child is sick please send this uh this kind of money or they are in danger and they would be vulnerable to uh, from that point so we with those projects we we started um seeing the need of getting more women into the space of cyber security capacity uh we started uh, we partnered with ITU uh we partnered with uh, some of the universities that uh, we were working on univer universities in Cape Town universities in uh, in Tanzania uh, on global cyber on capacity building ccb for women and uh, from there i see more women participating the, the alumni in those program participating actually so uh, i worked at the gcscc for like one or two year one and a half to two years and then i I felt like I wanted to develop my research capacity and uh, I moved to RIA. And the first project with RIA was uh, conceptualizing the feminist principles uh, that would go into the GDC. What's the new deal that we want? That resonated so much with me because through my work I've been seeing how women have been affected uh, disproportionately by ICT. Uh, they lack access uh, uh, lack of representation with the new technologies they become even more marginalized because they are not seen in the new uh, technologies like ai which also automatically makes decisions uh, uh, for them so these decisions are biased even in the in the first place and from there we started developing not just feminist principles but african perspectives uh, to it uh, into this global processes that are actually starting which and we are we are continuing uh, to 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 make submissions to engage uh with the technical envoy and with other partners on this uh, uh feminist principles of them um in every in every submissions that we also make we also try to see the gender perspective of it and uh from the access research i think this is something that we've been saying through the igf uh, that the inequalities uh, that uh, that that are actually reflected from the after access surveys that women are so much disp disproportionately affected in such a way that there's so much uh, economic injustice for them to participate economically politically and even socially and what the after access survey does is to provide this this 
disaggregated data so that we can see the realities of, uh, of access and how they are affected even beyond. I'm going to stop here, um, and then I'll welcome any questions if you have. Thank you very much, Liz. And I, I must commend my panel because I think you have made our work a little bit easier because we have managed to touch on a number of things in your intervention. So looking at your experiences, some of the barriers, and maybe even some of the opportunities. So what I would like to do now, because I am mindful of time, and I also would like to give space for discussion and dialogue and Q&A. So I'm going to open the floor now for um, questions, comments, inputs, um, both from the online and those that are physically in the room. And for this, I am going to hand over to you, Alice, um, to manage for us this process. Um, and Fabiola, I think, will support you in terms of the online interventions. Over to you, Alice. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Toel, and thank you, thank you to all the uh, other panelists. So I'd like to, uh, to open it up uh, to any questions from the room. Uh, there are microphones, one there, one there. Um, and there's also roaming microphones. This one's working. I can just pass it. I want Andri to say what I told her many years ago. <laughs> uh, she looked at me in one of these, was it the, it was one of these meetings and said to me, because I offered, put up my hand to take notes, and she said, you never do that. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but actually, as, as, as um, someone said, I don't know, who was it, was it you, Liz, or someone said that if you take notes, it does give you a certain kind of power as well. Yes, it does. Um, no, I just wanted to say that I think, I mean, I mean, it's it's really amazing to listen to the stories. And um, Alice, a movie is a good idea, I think. Liz, <laughs> Liz is right there. Um, uh, my name is Anuit Esterhuisen, and I, um, together with Alison and the African Union, um, organize the African School on Internet Governance every year. And I think the one thing that I can say for that is that they that on the, we've made huge progress. We never struggle to get good women who are experts. Tuwela is one of the founders of the school, so having Tuwela there as well, it's just very difficult to get hold of her. She's so busy. But there are women in the field. We have them on this panel here, and there are others. Um, um, so the expertise is there. We always have at least half the participants also women, but there are still there's still resistance. I think there's still particular there's still assumptions. There's assumptions that women experts have to deal with women's issues, um, and that if women or gender issues are on the agenda, it has to be women that that put them on on the agenda. And then I think at the level of of, of cultural norms, of expectations of how women behave, there are still huge barriers. You know, I think uh, uh, several of you mentioned the the bullying, the, 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 the expectation of how to behave as a woman in this space. Um, you're not supposed to be controversial. You're not supposed to, to, to really be challenging, particularly not challenging people in authority. I think in Africa, there is respect as a very much part of the culture of how we work. And I think it can sometimes be a little bit of a barrier. But I think, I mean, what we try to do with the African school is at least create a space where there is, uh, where gender is recognized, even if that's not the focus, and where participants are made conscious of the need to be respectful and to, to listen to one another. So I think as the, one of our members of parliament who participated in this year's school, when they wanted one of the women staff members to type their notes, she said no. And in a way, that's how we are trying to contribute to, to establish more sensitivity to that. But I just want to commend you, really. I mean, I was listening to you and talk of those early, early years with, with Minister Tuju, how hopeful we were, we were and then how many challenges there were. Um, I really think there has been a, a substantial change. There's still lots of challenges, but compared to the early 2000s, I think there's just, there is more recognition, there is more space um, for women to, to be in this space, and I think it's done by people like yourselves, and Alison over there as well, yes. who never stops annoying 
government officials and policymakers <laughs> with all her very disturbing statistics. Yeah. Thank you, Henriette. Um, uh, yes, please. Is it working? Uh, okay. Um, thank you, thank you, Alice, for uh, moderating this, and thank you for uh, weathering everything that you went through, and uh, it is absolutely wonderful. Um, I am a woman, you'll be surprised, because on my right side is a woman, and on my left side is a man. So together, if you take the word woman, you put a bracket on at the Middle. man, so you find the set is a woman, and a man in a subset. So I am a subset of a woman. Um, my mother didn't go to school, and it is because of a man. Uh, his brother, when uh, uh, sh she passed to go to the grade four, she was told that uh, you cannot go to school because you are supposed to be uh, working, doing the fields and taking care of the cows. So when my mother told me that story, I made up my mind then when I was in primary school that when I grow up, you know, if I have a boy and a, and, and a girl, they will grow on equal footing. So uh, thank you for uh, everything. So my, my uh, thing really is to say that um, um, we really need to make sure that uh, we continue to support girls and boys to grow up together, to work together, to support each other, so that uh, um, as they grow up to, to become full women and men, they defend each other in terms of uh, supporting each other. That is all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you for being an ally. <laughs> this lady there. Hi, uh, hello. Um, sorry, I had my hands up. I'm behind you. Hello. Oh. Hi. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Can I ask? Yes, please. Thank you. <laughs> sorry. Um, so um, my name is Tigus. I am from APC. Um, so now everyone is looking at me, so I'm just scared. <laughs> um, I've been following the conversation actually online because I was supporting a friend who was in need of um, some consulting. But thank you, Fabian, for sending me the link. So I have listened to most of the conversation. And it has been very engaging and so inspiring to hear uh, feminist researchers having a conversation in a room because I think we are stuck with gender as part of analysis but not feminism being welcome in spaces. So it's a good and refreshing thing to hear. I have a couple of questions. Maybe uh, if, par if par the panelists can respond to. The first one is, I mean, in this IGF, one of the things that we have realized is um, uh, thanks to uh, organizations like APC after decades of struggle that we now get to see um, online gender-based violence with its t new terminology, technology facilitated gender-based violence being part of the agenda. You hear it everywhere, everyone is picking it up, which is awesome, which means that part of the struggle has been won, so that's a good thing, but now, for me, my question is, it seems like in terms of, I, I, it, this comes from a research perspective, it seems that we are much more inclined into talking about um, online harassment, which are very you know, valid uh, conversation that need to be, to be having, and um, doxing and other, there are very predictable um, thematic areas that we, pick, we keep on picking up on. And I feel like there has to be a ways in which feminists have to start thinking about expanding the idea of violence, specifically online, from a multiple perspective. And I think I kind of came to that realization after we have experienced, I'm also from Ethiopia, a war in different regions. And uh, the online space being a propaganda space for justification of rape against women. And, and that being seen not only from a government perspective, but also even from international media who have been recording around that. And I think that kind of recording, that kind of work needs to resurface in this space so that the urgency of the matter can be much more pertinent. 
So that's my invitation, and also I would like to ask for people to start thinking about expanding the idea of online gender-based violence for multiple spaces. The other one is um, how feminist is our work? I think uh, I'm asking that because we tend to write feminism, but we end up doing a gender analysis. For me, they are two different things because feminism has its own values in terms of really prioritizing women in gender diverse communities. And in that sense, how do you reflect about the sector that we are working on? And then how are you dealing with trying to bring in feminist issues in that space uh, by dealing with those who are only interested in the analysis of it? The, uh, the last question I have is, and also how do you deal with, um, this is also again from a research perspective, one of my critics that I have is, in this kind of online gender-based violence, we tend to categorize women in the LGBTQ community together, and then the analysis, even the conversation end up being about women. And so how do feminists start making sure that they, the LGBT community are not just there as a list, but also as an active allies and active contributors of knowledge? And so, yeah, I'm asking that question. Thank you. Uh, thank you for those questions. Uh, would any of the panelists, because these are research questions, can I hand that to Nena uh, and, uh, and to Liz? Yeah, Liz, do you want to start to respond? Nena, please. Yeah, Nena can start. Is Nena still online? Yes, I'm Is here. Nena? Thank you very much. And I think it's also a very important question mm -hmm. for, for Bonita. Um, she has also been engaged in research. Um, just to say that Tiggy's points um, they are very, very valid. Um, one of the things, the project I talked about, the edited project that we're struggling to work on, I think chapter two of that book is entirely on a topic um, I've termed Afro cyber feminism. And interestingly, you know, you're talking about these points. I agree with you. Sometimes it seems like the conversation is all about, you know, just cyber harassment. But I also want to point out that there are also other aspects of the, co it's a broad um, discourse more than, in fact, when Tawella was talking, I was like, apart from rural women, there are also questions of refugees, women who are refugees in Africa. Nobody is really talking about this group. And in terms of access, in terms of rights, um, there are absolutely so many discussions that need to be had. But um, I just want to say that, except we work together, I've been very careful not to talk about personal experience, because if I do, people in the room or people online would actually pinpoint at maybe who I'm referring to in terms of some of the conversations and the challenges um, that we tend to have. Um, one of the things Lizzie also pointed out to is we've moved from this space of technical expertise to, you know, broader aspects, policy and all of that. And I'm excited to see that Anred Allison is in the room. I think we need to work more together and bring together the stories. Um, the stories I've heard today um, gives a reflection of the research perspectives we need to put out there. But what challenge you tend to have, like I said earlier, is lack of researchers that are, you know, homegrown. Again, um, I had the cybercrime working group of the GFCE. There is also the challenge of the global north and the global south dichotomy, which you find reflected in mm -hmm. issues of research. For example, talking of LGBTQ, we have to look at the African realities and acceptance of these issues and then advocacy and campaigning to push these conversations. The fact that there are people in those groups who would want to also tell their stories, but because of the African reality to these perspectives, they also can't come out to speak about their realities. So there is that global south, global north dichotomy me. I wish we can also move from just having an African conversation to more of a global South where we can look at um, challenges and look at commonalities in both regions. I think it would help if you look at, for example, Latin America and this sort of Afro um, cyber feminism conversations and even from the LGBTQ perspective, there is a lot to share. So um, finally, just because of time, um, there are bodies, for example, like the UNECA, I know they are happy to work with organizations like um, I know Research ICT is doing a lot. I think that there should be more platforms for research. People want to write. I know more and more academics in Africa, they want to write, but you also have this sort of westernized approach to writing. Most people who are writing about Africa are actually not in Africa. 
and that's a huge challenge. People tell you that um, pub publishers don't actually want to work with them because they can't um, validate the authenticity of the research coming from some of the universities in Africa. And I find that very off-putting. It's mm. triggering for me. But then um, you find that people want to tell your stories more than you can actually tell your story. And I think Anret is here, the internet um, governance school. It's a great agenda. And I think it will be an opportunity to, to highlight more of these issues, um, as well as give opportunities for more platforms for women to talk about this from the points you've raised. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Nena, for that. And actually, thank you so much for bringing up the issue of the global north and global uh, majority uh, dichotomy, because it even even more nuanced than that, there's uh, the whole difference. The f when you look at feminism, there's the the way black women look at feminism, and the way other non-black women look at feminism. There's also that dichotomy that I think we should not shy away from um, um, from talking about it. Uh, it should not, you know, it's a controversial issue, and we should not, uh, Liz. And then uh, there's a lady. There's another. Yeah. There's someone in the ready mic. Yes. Oh, here, I can give you this one. Okay. I can take it out. <laughs> uh, oh, it's to Liz. <laughs> Liz. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Let, let's here, take this one. Uh, is this one working? Thank you. Yeah, so uh, um, I get it that what was asked was uh, the terminologies of uh, feminism as uh, it's in different uh, regions, which you've actually started talking about. And uh, this is something that we've realized, uh, not just in my work with Ria, also with uh, Kiktanet, because some of these concepts uh, come from the Global North because the funding is also coming from the Global North. It comes with the conceptualization of how the Global North faces it. And uh, when you come to the ground, uh, you realize that there's a disconnect, uh, that people don't really understand, either under don't understand what you're saying or they just listen to you, but uh, there's no impact that uh, is actually going uh, to, to happen. The other, di the other kinds of differences in these terminologies is uh, how also um, different regions in Africa also conceptualizes the term uh, because it's different from Francophone region, West African region, East African region, uh, South African region. And uh, also what you're trying to do at uh, Research ICT Africa is to also unearth some of these conceptualizations uh, so that uh, when you are talking to policymakers, uh, what are we equipping them with? Are we equipping them with evidence from what you get uh, from the ground? And also with our consultation, we also try to reach as wide as we can so that we also get um, the contributions uh, from especially from Francophone, which is not really covered uh, in the work that we do. So yeah, the other one was on uh, cyber harassment uh, and rights, which is also kind of the same. Most of the work that, uh, that uh, organizations in Africa and uh, women do uh, first go to uh, cyber harassment, uh, digital rights, people, uh, women accessing opportunities, and which is rightly so because um, we look at these things as just one theme, but it's one theme that is actually affecting other areas of uh, women participation, be it in uh, in business participation, because so much businesses are going online, so market, so much marketing is actually going online, and when women, when women can't participate in these social spaces, it means that they can't market themselves, they can't even run for office. There's uh, this training that we actually did after Kenyan elections uh, we, where we called women who vied and uh, started getting their experiences on how uh, they performed and whether they would like to vie again. And uh, they were so discouraged because uh, of, of the journey that they've, went, uh, they've gone through. So it's, it's a series of harassment one after another, and through the campaign period, they think that this is just the last one uh, until we go to vote. And then after voting, they even realize that uh, even the promises that they got from the ground, uh, nothing 
not, nothing just uh, actually materialized. So they think back and they're like, all these hurdles that they, they've passed through, including cyber harassment, was it worth it uh, when it doesn't actually translate even to a single vote? So when we did, um, uh, when we actually did that training, and it was a wholesome training, not just a, a cyber security training, but also for them how to engage themselves. Uh, much of it covered media literacy and digital literacy. You start uh, getting hope and. Uh, uh, different approaches in how they also engage the society. So coming back to the terminologies and how they help uh, how to translate on the ground is that some of these approaches, we have to be careful in how we translate them from the West coming down because uh, it means that the, these trainings that we do, uh, as much as we get funding from them, they are, one, they're not having an impact and two, they're even doing worse because they go out there with so much confidence, but yet uh, uh, they get even more backlash when it comes to when it comes to implementation. I think the first digital security trainings we emphasized on women uh, having a thick skin, which really didn't help. Um, and we tried to uh, conceptualize things like how should we uh, how should we take on our content online? Should we uh, go with the norms that are actually there? Uh, if a woman is supposed to to market themselves with how they dress, should they continue or should they continue with engaging with content? And we started mapping out um, uh, how much of these uh, women or giving examples of uh, women politicians especially who actually engage online uh, with political ideologies rather than other types of content that uh, that are quite popular and uh, when telling them that uh, there are realities that uh, there are women who are out there who uh, don't actually conform to this content that are, are popular and are actually attract so much cyber bullying and cyber violence and they can actually engage in ideologies, then they start seeing these examples uh, as things that can actually work and they've actually started trying them out. So yeah, in conclusion, I think, uh, yeah, this, we can form our own uh, ideologies of how that would look like. Uh, and how, uh, what approaches that you can use uh, in engaging when seeking higher positions, political positions, and or whatever social positions that you want. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, so my first response, not a question, just supplementing the conversation, um, she's asked a question that, are you equipping policymakers with evidence? And that is my thought process this whole time, which takes me back to a time last year when I was invited as a note taker for a consultation meeting where our, my name is Claire and I'm from Uganda. Our Ministry of Information and Technology was, was trying to introduce a bill that is going to review policies and laws governing the media industry in Uganda, and we're holding consultation meetings. This particular consultation meeting was this big, with just one woman, two women, another lady, and myself was taking notes. So I listened to the conversation and the views that everyone in the room had and did my job as a note taker. When I was done with my report, what I did was to write my own recommendations as a note taker. That okay, well, this is what was discussed, but I think that we can do better to get more diverse views. And I wrote about three pages of recommendations at the end, and then included a list of women, what they do, and how they can contribute to this discussion. And I also included um, evidence. Uh, one of the reports I attached was uh, the report by policy that Bonita has been working on that talks about cyber harassment and stuff. And other reports that have talked about uh, issues affecting uh, women in the media industry in Uganda. So I attached that to the report and included a note in the email to the person who had invited me. I said, uh, here's the report. I didn't participate in the discussion because I had to listen 
to your views, but I've also added my views as a woman who is going to, who is in the media industry and is affected by these issues. I've also included recommendations of women you can invite in future. <laughs> um, within a month or so, uh, there was another activity that was involving the women that I had listed. So I think sometimes you just have to use the little opportunity you have to make your mark. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted from the perspective of a policy maker in, in the German Development Corporation uh, address some of the things that have been uh, uh, said here. I mean, uh, first of all, I, I very much agree with my uh, co-panelists that uh, labels are uh, uh, something that, that is quite uh, difficult and we have, I would say, quite different conceptualizations of what feminism means, both between the global north and the, the global south, but it is also something that even if, if I look at my own country, Germany, you will find a huge diversity of different uh, feminist uh, perspectives and, and streams. And I think what is important is not to, to lose the final end out of sight, which is that, I mean, there certainly are differences, but I think quite often the issues that we're facing are quite basic and there are, there's a lot of common ground, there are a lot of interfaces between different diverging opinions that, that we share together. And I think if we want to achieve something jointly, I think we should focus on that rather than dwelling on or having conceptual debates about which, uh, which label is the, is the right one. Um, the, the second point that I think concerns us as policymakers a lot uh, is also the question of how we, we translate what, what we observe, what we see into practice. Because we, I mean, we, we are always interested in improving the development interventions that we do. And I think it's very important to have discussions like this and rely on the findings of research to actually have evidence-based uh, interventions. And I think we often find that we're still lacking a lot of detailed knowledge of what are the specific ex uh, uh, obstacles that, that women face uh, in terms of access to, to digital services, for example, uh, on the one hand, so what's the diagnosis of what, is, uh, what are the issues, and on the other hand, what are effective ways even if we know them, how to how to address them, because we often work also in highly complex multi-stakeholder policy environments where there are power structures ingrained in informal structures, in ministries, in organizations, and so even the, having just a diagnosis is not enough to really design uh, effective interventions. And I think that's why the discussions like this are very important. Mm -hmm. Hi everyone, um, I, my name is Tashi, I'm from India. Uh, it's been a very fascinating discussion because although I'm not from the region, um, I have worked in the region in some way or the other. And I like how everyone talks about policy, people talk about regulation. Uh, my question was, I was actually looking at uh, what are some of the best practices and solutions mm -hmm. Uh, that organizations have when it comes to convincing women to come forward and report a complaint. Um, and also, I mean, and complain of an abuse or harm. Mm -hmm. um, I, I used to work on uh, building multilingual repository of hate speech lexicons. Mm -hmm. Uh, policy, uh, people were talking, someone was here from policy. Policy actually used our data set for a, a report that they did out for uh, online abuses against uh, female politicians in Uganda. And I think there's also a new report uh, out for the Tanzanian region. Um, I'm more interested in learning about how these discussions uh, can help uh, platform accountability. Mm -hmm. Uh, not not with big tech, but maybe smaller platforms mm -hmm. uh, that would take uh, these mechanisms seriously. But I'm really curious as to how Mozilla is leading that work or GIZ is leading that work in uh, keeping platforms accountable and how uh, 
do we find solutions? Uh, because there are so many of these mechanisms, but we also see that a lot of women are not confident uh, with moving online and sharing their grievances or complaint. Um, and I know that I'm running out of time, but yes, yeah. I was just curious. That, that would be the last question, and perhaps we can, uh, to, to Tobias, you want to start on uh, how perhaps GIZ deals, uh, whether how GIZ deals with that first. Do you want to start? The question is some examples, and we've only. Yeah, yeah. Then we can do. Okay, so. <laughs> so oh, so yeah. We've only got five more minutes. I'm so sorry. Um, uh, you know, at Mozilla, we're, we're very lucky. To begin with, Mozilla was founded by a woman. <laughs> so, you know, and um, we have, um, you know, Mitchell Baker, she's the founder, chairperson, and current CEO of Mo the Mozilla Corporation. Uh, and actually, more than nearly 90% of the executives are women. Uh, so, very, very proud uh, of Mozilla. Um, you know, uh, and, and we actually really work hard to, uh, to, <laughs> to try and, and engage as many uh, women as we can, and not just engaging them, uh, but we go beyond, for example, you know, understanding the role that women play in society and community, that they steal that societal expectation. Uh, so we make, we make space uh, for, for, for that kind of thing, for example, you know, you know parental, uh, understanding that their parental ob obligations are usually, you know, <laughs> placed on women, uh, and a real emphasis on en on engaging um, on capacity building, especially uh, you know for, for women. We haven't got it right yet. Uh, it's still an issue, and it's still an issue we are we are um, we are struggling with, even as uh, a mission based company. Um, and really looking forward to working with other organizations to be able to uh, to find really lasting and sustainable solutions uh, to support that. And in fact, that brings me to one issue that we've done, for example, and uh, together with the African Union and Toella, we conducted a research um, on, on the startup ecosystem and women entrepreneurs, because that is one thing that we haven't touched on. And when you look at that, for example, the African continent, more than 80% uh, of uh, micro, small, and medium entrepreneurs are women, uh, and yet they receive only 0.3, not two percent, of funding and VC support. Um, you know, across the continent. Um, then, when you go to the states where you know where I live, uh, recently, I'm sure I don't know how many of you had there was an appeal. You know where um, a court ordered a black woman's uh, organization, I can't remember what it's called, uh, to pose providing um, uh, funding uh, to black women uh, claiming discrimination, a conservative group. Yet, when you look at uh, the amount of VCs that those black women in the US receive, it's 0.3 percent. You know, so we still have a huge problem. Uh, you know, um, you know, women do most of the work, and we still haven't uh, um, uh, managed to come up with solutions. So I mean, I, I'll end there. I'm so sorry. Um, I cannot uh, accommodate any more questions. I'd like to hand over back to Toella uh, for closing remarks. Back to you, Toella. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Alice, and, and thank you really to everybody for the different comments, questions, and inputs. I am going to attempt to give us maybe five key takeaways from this discussion. Um, the first one I think is that we need to acknowledge and recognize the fact that there are very many dimensions in terms of uh, talking about feminism and a feminist internet. There are also very many dichotomies that exist uh, as we navigate that space. The second thing I think that is important as a recommendation is that we need to really put a lot more emphasis on experience sharing. And this experience sharing should be um, between um, the different uh, stakeholders on the continent, between regions on the continent, between Africa and the global south, and then of course between the global south and the global north. The third one um, I think is that we need uh, more um, uh, opportunities and spaces to bring out the data the evidence, the insights. We need to be able to tell our own stories as Africans and African women. We need to value each other. We need to value our work and value our research. Oftentimes we value the research that comes at us and to us from outside the continent. And we need to start, I think, valorizing our own research and creating these spaces where we can actually undertake this research, but also disseminate 
um, these findings to our policymakers and into the relevant spaces. The fourth one, I think, is capacity building, um, that we need to continue investing in capacity building, um, cyber capacity building, maybe more specifically. Um, and to this point, I think just to mention the fact that there is an Africa cyber capacity building agenda um, that it has been developed that will be um, launched um, later this year. And I think it will be incumbent upon all of us to see how do we participate in that? How do we contribute to that um, to make sure that uh, we are building the requisite capacity? But again, as I always stress, being mindful of the fact that um, this should not be an elitist type of um, way that we work when we look at capacity building, because that capacity has to start all the way from the grassroots um, and, and find its way um, in terms of making sure that we are equipping everybody um, that needs to uh, be equipped on the continent. The last one, I think, is really about the accountability um, and, and really looking at the fact that we have an overarching framework in the AU digital transformation strategy and all the different policies and frameworks that are emanating from that. And then the question is, how do we make sure that we are holding um, each other to account? How do we make sure that issues of gender indeed are being adequately captured and reflected as we develop all these different frameworks, strategies, and, and implement them? Um, lastly, I think that, um, so, you know, going out of all of this, I think perhaps if I recall from the Africa IDF, one of the things that was raised is that we like to talk and we talk a lot and then we talk and then we leave and, and nothing happens. So the question for us is what is going to happen after this? Um, personally, um, I think as AUD and EPAD and as myself, my commitment is really on the digital transformation strategy. Um, really making sure um, that um, when we are starting to implement this strategy, that these issues that we are talking about will be adequately reflected. And then I'm inviting all of you also to think, you know, what is your commitment? What is it that you are going to do in terms of um, taking forward some of these things that we have discussed today? I will invite you to continue the discussions. Uh, for those of us that are online, we'll continue the discussions online. For those of you at the IGF, please make use of the breaks and all the other spaces to have these conversations. And with that, I want to thank my panelists, uh, Alice, Nena, Bonita, Liz, and Tobias, um, and also thank Fabiola and Anri and Catherine, who've been working in the background and wishing you all um, a great day further um, and also um, an enjoyable rest of the IGF. Thank you very much.